Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Fusion Industry Association. My name is Sid Cowley. I'm a PhD student working at the Cullum Center for Fusion Energy and studying at the University of York. Today is Wednesday, the 5th of April, and I'm here to give you your Fusion News update. Stories today include 1. Fusion startup Type 1 Energy gets $29 million seed round to fast track its reactor designs. 2. It's time to fall in love with nuclear fusion again. 3. Can nuclear fusion power the future? 4. Fusion power is coming back into fashion. And as always, I'll have some bonus stories at the end for you. 1. Fusion startup Type 1 Energy gets $29 million seed round to fast track its reactor designs. Our first story today features in a number of news outlets, including Universe Today, TechCrunch, and Business Wire. The story today covers Type 1 Energy, a Wisconsin-based fusion startup and fusion industry association member aiming to create magnetic confinement fusion power plants, but not through a tokamak, which you might be more familiar with. Instead, Type 1 Energy wants to leverage Stellarators, a fascinating type of fusion device which generates a twisted magnetic field inside a donut-shaped tube of plasma. But rather than achieving this twistedness, or helicity as we call it, using two separate coils like tokamaks do, Stellarators use one set of incredibly complex twisted coils. This avoids a lot of issues to do with plasma currents that tokamaks have, but also adds to the complexity of building the device, which is why Stellarators are less researched uh, than tokamaks. But despite that, there are a number of incredibly interesting Stellarators operating throughout the world, including the W7X Stellarator in Germany or the HSX in Madison, Wisconsin. The story today covers a recently closed $29 million funding round for Type 1 Energy, whose backers include Breakthrough Energy Ventures, a $2 billion clean energy fund co-founded by Bill Gates. With this funding, Type 1 hopes to rapidly expand the company, which is still currently a relatively small venture, with less than 10 full-time employees. This now brings the total investment into Type 1 Energy up to $30.7 million, which isn't nearly enough to build a power plant from, but can get Type 1 Energy more seriously on track to delivering Stellarator-based fusion. So I'm really excited. Two, it's time to fall in love with nuclear fusion again. Our next story comes from Wired magazine and covers nuclear fusion's plagued history, its groundbreaking present, and its exciting future. Now, at first, the article discusses the truly grand and revolutionary prospects of fusion. Prospects of saving the environment and collapsing authoritarian states propped up by their control of the energy market. And though these prospects are tantalizing, also led to a great deal of misinformation and even fraud in nuclear fusion's history. Of these, the most famous case was in 1989, where two electrochemists at the University of Utah had declared they achieved sustained nuclear fusion at room temperature with relatively simple tabletop experiments. This idea of cold fusion has now long since been debunked, but its shadow still paints mistrust over fusion even today. More recently, however, Virginia Heffernan, who writes for Wired, says she is ready to fall back into love with fusion, not least because of the recent results of the National Ignition Facility, a laser facility in the US, which last year, as I'm sure many of you know, demonstrated the first ignited fusion plasma in the laboratory, and this year achieved the first net fuel gain of a nuclear fusion experiment in the laboratory. In addition, the author cites the private companies of the Fusion Industry Association, or the FIA, as a source of hope, since a recent survey by the FIA indicates that most company members believe that fusion will be on the grid by the 2030s. Now, this does give me a lot of hope, and it's nice to see someone from Wired being re-energized into the realm of fusion. But I must say, there are some of us that never fell out of love with it to begin with. Three, can nuclear fusion power the future? Our third story today is an episode of the really fantastic science program, The Future with Hannah Fry, available on Bloomberg. In episode four, entitled, Can Nuclear Fusion Power the Future? Professor Fry takes a deep dive into the prospects of nuclear fusion powering our society in the future. In it, she discusses facilities such as the National Ignition Facility, ITER, the largest tokamak in the world currently being built in France, and FIA members, TAE Technologies. 
One of my favorite things about this program is that Professor Fry really listens to the scientists and engineers that she talks to and meets and presents their views in an open and honest way. She highlights the frustration that a lot of fusion scientists feel, having their field be vastly underfunded and overlooked for decades. But she also stresses the energetic enthusiasm of the private industry, trying to turn that decades-old frustration into action. This is a fantastic program, and I really recommend you check it out. Four, fusion power is coming back into fashion. Our final story today comes from The Economist and is a fantastic longer overview piece on the various methods of fusion and the different organizations trying to achieve it. But first, the article discusses the central difficulty of nuclear fusion, which is the Lawson's criterion, a set of criterion required to achieve an ignited plasma. This requires sufficient pressures and low losses of energy. In order to achieve this, we need to squeeze our fusion fuel, otherwise known as confinement, of which there are a few methods. In this article, The Economist lists four broad methods, including magnetic confinement fusion, which uses strong, usually superconducting magnet coils to squeeze the plasma. This is probably the method you're most familiar with, and it's being pursued by companies such as Tokamak Energy and Commonwealth Fusion Systems, as well as the UK government through their STEP program. Another method is through inertial confinement fusion, which works by physically compressing a fusion fuel, either by ablating the outer layer using a laser or by hitting it directly with some projectile. Organizations such as the National Ignition Facility in the US are pursuing this laser inertially driven approach, whilst smaller, more agile companies such as First Light Fusion are pursuing the projectile inertial confinement fusion. Other lesser known approaches mentioned by the article include magnetized target fusion, where a fusion plasma is compressed by loads of pistons and the plasma is sort of surrounded by a spinning wall of liquid lithium metal. This approach is being championed by the Canadian company General Fusion. The final approach mentioned, which is being developed by FIA members Helion and TAE Technologies, is the so-called field reverse configuration. This involves generating two loops of plasma and colliding them at the center of a linear device. Now, as well as the differences in confinement approaches, the article highlights the different mixtures of fuels being used by the different organizations. The most conventional fuel mixture, as I'm sure you've heard before, is so-called DT or deuterium tritium, two isotopes of hydrogen. However, companies such as Helion Energy propose using a deuterium helium mix, and companies such as TAE Technologies are set to try and fuse protons with boron. Now, this article is fantastic at highlighting the differences between organizations and companies, but also highlights the collaborations that we're seeing more and more these days. For example, both General Fusion, First Light Fusion, and Tokamak Energy recently announced a collaboration with the UK Atomic Energy Authority at their site in Cullum in the UK. These collaborations will hopefully foster more of a collective effort for achieving fusion and will foster a fantastic hub of fusion talent in the UK. Right, well, that's all for the main stories today. For our first bonus story today, we have an article from World Nuclear News outlining a memorandum of understanding between the UK Atomic Energy Authority and the Korea Institute for Fusion Energy. It's a cooperation on remote handling and maintenance for fusion power plants. As our second bonus, we also have an episode from the Babbage podcast from The Economist. In the podcast, we hear from world-leading experts on fusion, from the UK Atomic Energy Authority to Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory to Tokamak Energy and Commonwealth Fusion Systems. It's a real great overview, a bit of a long episode of 40 minutes, but it's a fantastic overview on uh, different approaches for nuclear fusion. I really recommend you check it out. Right, well, that's all for Fusion News this week. I really hope you enjoyed, and if you did, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. And of course, if you are interested in taking a deep dive into any of the stories we covered this week, their links will be in the description. And we also have our Fusion News Extra podcast where we occasionally take deep dives into some of these stories. That's all for Fusion News. Thank you for watching.